The United States just lost to Canada in World Cup qualifying at Canada. Dos a zero. Or as they call it in Canada, 2-0. Hi, if you're new here, I'm Filippo and welcome to Tactical Men TV. And welcome to another 7 Things We Learned episode where every single day following a U.S. Men's National Team match, we do a video on 7 things that I learned from this match. Feel free to comment yours down below. There's much more than 7 and I'd like to learn from you as well. Now, this was a very Greg Berhalter ball-like experience, and at one point I even thought we threw the towel early when he put in Paul Riola and Reggie Cannon. Regardless of what I think about our performance, I would like to open up this video here by saying congratulations to Canada. Look, their team has an identity, a strategy, and it works. Like I said in the live stream, they look like a team, while the US men's national team looks like a bunch of talented individuals that got together for a Sunday pickup game. No organization, no patterns of play, no identity. We essentially just don't look like a team. Now, with that said, and I'll, I'll talk about the rest in the video, don't forget to hit that like button, smash it, subscribe if you enjoyed the channel, comment down below what you learned. Let's play the intro and let's get started with lesson number one. Lesson number one is that Greg Berhalter has lost touch with reality, or if he hasn't lost touch with reality, he's at least so stubborn that it makes it look like he has. Here's what Greg Berhalter said in his post-match comments, and this is just a little bit of it, right? You can go look up more, but this is the one thing that caught my attention. He said, the result hurts, but the performance does not hurt. So here's the problem I have with this. I thought all that mattered were the results. Wasn't that the excuse for when we were playing poorly and we still got wins? What happened there? Every time we would win playing poorly, they said the results were what mattered. Now they're just saying the performance is what matters and that we played super well and the result was just what was bad. But to be honest, to me, both hurt. The result hurt and the performance wasn't good. It looked like we dominated the game because that's Canada's strategy. They let you control possession. They soak up the pressure and they try to score in transition and they're very efficient and effective when you make a mistake. So sorry, there's really no way a coach can think that performance was good. Maybe Greg Berhalter needs to meet up with Morpheus and take the red pill. Yeah, man, I, I don't know what to say about his comments right there. You know, um, the result and the performance worry me, but his comments worry me more because it means he's completely satisfied with what he saw besides goal scoring. So he thinks everything else was fine. Lesson number two is that not playing for two months might make you lose match sharpness or make you not look sharp when you're playing. And I know this kind of sounds like common sense, but apparently it isn't. Yeah, I'm talking about Miles Robinson. Did he look sharp yesterday? Well, last time he played was November 21st when Atlanta lost to New York City FC for the MLS playoffs. And I mean, we've seen the best out of Miles Robinson in what we saw yesterday. That did not look like a sharp in form Miles Robinson. And you know what? Miles Robinson still belongs to the national team, in my opinion, but he's in off season. And then you have other great options, such as Cameron Carter Vickers, that is in the best form of his life, playing for Celtic in the Scottish Premiership, probably the best defender in the league. You got John Brooks, a defender capable of playing in the Champions League and doing just fine. So my problem is not that Miles Robinson is in the team. I'm fine with that. It's just that right now he's in offseason. You could have had other players, right? He didn't even he wasn't even in the December camp. Match sharpness and form matter. And for that, the player needs to be playing. Not just playing minutes, right? Needs to be in season. Miles was in vacation. All he had was these two weeks. And there's many other players. I think even Matt Turner, for example, didn't look as sharp as Matt Turner normally is. But that's just an oversimplification of it. That's all I have to say for lesson number two. Lesson number three is something that I'm going to repeat. That I It was a lesson from the previous one. The seven things we learned from El Salvador. This one we learned again. And I've been asking for this for a while. The United States has to start their matches sharp. Look, we didn't look good on the ball or in the game. We weren't looking alert. We weren't looking sharp at all. Matt Turner's goal kick that led to a goal is a proof of that. Then Miles Robinson and Chris Richards didn't seem to be as focused and as ready for that loss of ball, which led to Canada getting a good combo between David and Laren, a 1-2 that led to their goal. Again, you have to start the game sharp. We saw that in Gold Cup. The United States start every single game sharp and focused. And again, I said this in the last video. This is not on Greg. This is on the players. Leadership. Talking to each other in the game. Make sure everyone's focused, wired, fired up. 
it has to happen it hasn't been happening in the past few games for the u.s men's national team and it's unfortunate i gave the example also of the l3 game in costa rica in the last video so you can check that out on the seven things we learned from el salvador lesson number four is that we need someone that can be a consistently good set piece taker and christian pulisic has shown that he can be very good but it seems like to have constant ups and downs with him in terms of set piece taking not just that, you go to Brendan Aronson as well. Same thing when he takes it, even though last game he didn't, uh, this game against Canada, he didn't actually. But essentially, you need that. We have players like Weston McKinney, Miles Robinson, Chris Richards, and many others that can come in that are very dangerous on set pieces. And we have to start taking advantage of that much more, right? We almost scored in this game with Weston McKinney off a header. We won Nations League last season off set pieces. It's a key weapon that we have with this national team, and we just need a consistent good set piece taker. Um, is that on Greg? Obviously not. I don't know. Players need to train it. We need to find someone. I know Gianluca Busio can be a possibility in the future. We'll see. Um, but we saw the importance of having a fantastic or a prolific set piece taker. Lesson number five is something we're learning along World Cup qualifying. Many of us might have already learned this in the past, but how much it matters to have a true nine, a center forward that can score goals. And here's the thing with Canada. They have two. So yeah, you look at the Canadian men's national team, a big part of their success is having players that can put the ball in the back of the net. I'm talking about Kyle Lahren. He scored twice in the U.S. men's national team throughout World Cup qualifying, right? He scored Nashville, scored again. Jonathan David, that we most certainly know he can score, and we saw that when they faced Honduras over the weekend. Having a prolific goal scorer, a guy that can put the ball in the back of the net, matters a lot. And unfortunately, we... Well, we do have some guys that can be options, right? PFOC has been doing that in Europe. Maybe he can be an option. The DK can do it. Pepe can do it, but is in poor form. Sargent, <laughs> not so much. Maybe he will once he picks up his confidence and it looks like he's going on the right direction, but Sargent technically no. But having that is key, and we need to have that nine, the guy that can put the ball in the back of the net. Hopefully Pepe picks up his form once again. I'm just telling you guys, Jesse Zardes ain't that guy. That's what I saw in this game, and we've been talking about this for a while. Lesson number six is that the U.S. men's national team very often overcrowds wherever they are in possession in the final third. And I, I don't know if you guys noticed this in the game as well. You can comment down below if you did. Very often when Pulisic would get the ball, you'd see Weston or Musa approach him. Robinson, Brendan would pinch in sometimes. The center forward, Zardes or Pepe would come. It, it was just so messy. Every time you get the ball, it would just overcrowd that area instead of opening up space. And then it just happened to Pulisic. When Brendan would get the ball, anyone would get the ball. It seems like we overcrowd that area like a bunch of 12-year-olds. And I'm not trying to defend Pulisic here. I know his performance wasn't that great. Um, but he tried, was able to draw some fouls, and very often you need to give players like him space to drive into the lane, into the spaces, and draw fouls, and even sometimes drill past the defender, get an assist or a goal. Now, this is something Greg Berhalter has to figure it out, but I just kind of lost hope from him figuring it out. I still believe we're going to make it to the World Cup with some ease. We're going to get the points and get the job done, and we're going to make it to Qatar. I just lost hope from seeing tactical improvements with Greg Berhalter, tactical variations, anything, Okay. I don't like to lose hope, but I, I don't know, man. I don't know about you guys. But in terms of Greg, I just lost belief at this point. Speaking of Greg, that brings me to lesson number seven, which is Burhalter Ball, which I already talked about this so many times, hurts to watch and is super predictable. Look, it's always the same thing. Hold possession, find the flanks or the sides of the fields, whip and crosses, in hope for the best. Along with that, a lot of hero ball with Burhalter ball because there's no play. It's just that. Hold possession, find the flanks, whip and crosses. No creativity through the middle. Nothing. No freedom. It doesn't look like a team. We never look like a team. While Canada, you could clearly see their set strategy. They looked like a team. They soaked up pressure. They attacked well in transition and they were effective when they had opportunities. So yeah, that's it. But essentially the lesson is that Burhalter's strategy is overly predictable at this point and good coaches like john herdman have figured it out all right everyone that does it for this video and sorry that it almost sounded like a funeral it was very depressing and the game on wednesday against honduras we need to get the three points there's no other way we need to get the three points the camp we have in march is the last one for World Cup qualifying we have three games two of them are away against the mexico and costa rica and one of them is at home against panama so if we don't get three points against honduras i will start to get a little bit worried if we get there 
We'll be fine. We need to win the two home games and we'll make it to Qatar. With that said, make sure to hit that like button before you leave the video. Thank you very much and comment down below what you learned. Don't forget also to check our Tactical Manager Clips channel. The link is on the description. Thus, we'll be posting highlight clips of our live streams and interviews with other players. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. I'll see you guys on Wednesday. The Honduras preview will drop on Tuesday. The live stream will be on Wednesday. And Pete will be back for that one. So shout out to Pete for that. Thank you for watching, everyone. Have a great day. Yes. <laughs>